evening, everyone. You are in store for a lovely night of music and music discussion. I assume you are all music lovers? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Let me hear you now. Yeah. All right, all right. Well, here we go. My name is Marion Brooks, if you're wondering who this anonymous person is up here. I work with NBC5 News as the anchor of the 4.30 and 5 o'clock news, and they've asked me to host this event and act as moderator for the evening, so go easy on me. <laughs> And on behalf of the Chicago Department of Cultural Affairs, the Center for Black Music Research, and the History Makers, it is my pleasure to welcome you to Sounds of Music, a conversation on making music. This evening, we'll celebrate African American music in Chicago and investigate the lives of four professional musicians that have dedicated their lives to, mu to the music genres of jazz, classical, blues, and doo-wop. Now, before we begin our conversation, please welcome the founder and the executive director of the History Makers, Juliana Richardson. Thanks, Mary. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. The Sounds of Experience program is our fourth annual program in the humanities presented in honor of Black History Month. I want to thank our collaborative partners, Cynthia Quick, Director of Program Development at the Chicago Cultural Center, and Rosia Sands of the Center for Black Music Research, uh, Sh uh, Columbia College Chicago, for their efforts with tonight's program. We couldn't have done it without them. We are especially grateful to the Illinois Humanities Council for the grant that made this program possible, and to the Chicago Tribune, who has been a consistent sponsor and promoter of ours uh, from the beginning. And a special thank to Allie's Posey Patch, who always do lovely floral arrangements and Reed Tillinghast of Phil Stefani's signature restaurants who, for his donation of refreshments for our, our reception after tonight's program. You know, we have so many reasons to celebrate uh, and what and what better way to do so than through music? We stand today with over 700 interviews in our archives. We're, while we're a far cry from our 5,000 goal, we are the largest archive of our kind in the country. And our website, if you have not um, visited it, um, www.thehistorymakers.com, I'll get that little ad in there. Uh, we're actually uh, generating two million hits per month, and I'm really proud of that. Uh, we're probably gonna break the three million mark uh, this, this uh, month. We also, an important development is we actually are going to be establishing teams in other cities, um, primarily in Washington, D.C., Atlanta, New York, Cleveland and San Francisco. So we won't even be doing as many recordings in Chicago this year as we try to really nationalize our collection by um, regionalizing our efforts. We also are very happy uh, to have the support of the Hilton Hotels. Um, in, in actually three weeks, we're gonna be doing one of four salutes. One's gonna be here in Chicago, actually. Um, Harry Porterfield will be our master of ceremonies, and Skip Gates will be our featured guest, and we'll be honoring over um, 80 of our history makers. And we're gonna be taking that program to Washington, D.C. on April 30th, where Vernon Jordan will be the chair will be chairing that event, and honorary chairs are J.C. Watts and Congressman John Lewis, and then we'll be going to New York and L.A. later in the year. This spring, we're also partnering, as you see, we're doing a lot more events this year, um, but we're partnering with the Illinois Humanities Council to present three programs on the anniversary of Brown versus Board of Education. The first is on May 13th at the Harris Bank Auditorium. I'd like to welcome everyone there. We'll be featuring favorite Nicholas of the famed Nicholas Brothers and Amira Baraka, and they'll be discussing Brown versus Board of Education from an artist's perspective, the desegregation uh, movement and what effect it had on artists of various generations. Then on June 29th, um, we're going to gather Chicago teens and they'll be doing their own oral history interviews of some of the civil rights activists here in Chicago. And then one of my favorite programs, um, mainly because she had contacted us um, over a year ago. Uh, her name is Jenny Lagun. She was actually born on the south side of Chicago. If you look at any 
of the old movie She Dance. She was the pre preeminent uh, black uh, tap dancer in this country. And if you look at any of the old movies, you're sure to see, if you see a female tap dancer, it's sure to be um, Jenny Lagun. She was feeded last year by the Smithsonian. And we're going to feature her at a program at the Museum of Contemporary Art. It's actually going to kick off the Chicago Rhythm Project Festival, and we'll be showcasing the BBC documentary that aired on her called Living in a Great Big Way. Now, for tonight's program, the History Maker panelists who are with us tonight, Virginia Bayaki, Lonnie Brooks, Don Porter, and L.D. Young, represent the beauty of our archival collection. And for those of you who have not visited our facility, I welcome you to come by and look at our archives or look at one of the interviews. Um, each of our panelists tonight is accomplished and well-known in his or her field, but their accomplishments may not be as widely recognized as they should be, and that's our purpose this evening. Tonight, we will celebrate each of them and their extraordinary work. And now to give us some context on the history of black music in Chicago, I'd like to welcome Dr. Rosita Sands, director of the Center for Black Music Research, Columbia College, Chicago. Thank you. Dr. Sands. Thank you and good evening. From the last decade of the 19th century through the first two decades of the 20th century, the city of Chicago was a key destination for African Americans migrating from the South, particularly those coming from the Mississippi Delta, which was the home of what was truly a core component of rural black culture, the musical genre of the blues. The first significant wave of black migration to Chicago took place during the 1890s to 1915, while efforts were made to encourage black migration north through active recruitment for industrial jobs, blacks came north voluntarily and expectantly, seeking employment opportunities and a chance for a better life. By 1920, Chicago had the nation's second largest black population. Only Harlem's was larger. During this same period, Chicago was also gaining prominence as one of the country's show business centers, and as such, opportunities for employment in the entertainment and recording industry served as a magnet for those who possessed musical talent or musical ambition. Out of this environment came a new musical tradition, with the city of Chicago playing a key role in the transformation of the blues from its folk origins with acoustic instrumentation into a modern blues with amplified sounds. Some of the best blues recorded in the country were made in Chicago between the years 1924 and 1941, coalescing into a Chicago blues sound, an urban blues synthesis that was fueled by the continuous influx of down-home rural blues musicians who brought with them the artistic traditions they knew and the performance practices they refused to totally abandon. At the conclusion of World War II, Chicago was the undisputed capital of urban blues in the U.S. It was music for black people, by black people, or to borrow a phrase from Amiri Baraka, a blues music for blues people. Our music maker, Lonnie Brooks, is part of a long roster of Chicago-based blues musicians, including Big Bill Brunzi, Blind Lemon Jefferson, Sleepy John Estes, Memphis Minnie, and of course, in later decades, Buddy Guy, Muddy Waters, and B.B. King. During the post-World War period in this country, the music known as jazz was also migrating, being taken to new cities and new environments, wherever black people were going and, and being heard wherever they could be found. Like their blues musician counterparts, jazz musicians were lured to the city of Chicago, in particular during the 1920s, where they found a number of wildly diverse, hospitable settings for their music, including black, white, and black and tan cabarets, dance halls, cafes, clubs, and pool halls. During this period, Chicago was recognized for its status as the leading city in the number and quality of cabaret orchestras. Recordings that testify to this include Louis Armstrong's Hot Fives and Hot Sevens, Jelly Roll Morton's Red Hot Peppers, and recordings by King Oliver and Earl Hines. And our music maker, Chicago-born L.D. Young, is part of a long legacy of jazz musicians who were key in the development of a Southside cultural 
Chicago jazz tradition. From the late 1940s through the 50s, an urban popular music phenomenon known as doo-wop emerged and flourished across several large cities of the country, including New York, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, Detroit, and of course, Chicago. Doo-wop was a style of vocal music primarily performed a cappella. It had its roots in the black quartet singing that was popular in black churches. And there was no doubt a reciprocal influence on and from the rhythm and blues styles that were emerging around the same time. A typical doo-wop group was comprised of four or five members singing in close harmony with frequent use of falsetto. Lyrics were typically positive and often sentimental, focusing on love and longing in very innocent ways. A characteristic idiom of doo-wop was its heavy reliance on non-lexical or nonsense syllables, such as doo-wop, doo-wah, and shaboom, used in the background vocals as ways of imitating instrumental sounds. Doo-wop groups gave themselves colorful and evocative names, many taken from birds, such as the Flamingos, a Chicago doo-wop group popular in the 1950s. But there was also the Velvetones from Chicago, and of course, a group by the name of the Spaniels that our music maker, Chicago-born Donald Porter, sang with, marking his contribution to the historical legacy of doo-wop. The vast body of music created and composed by black Americans represents a repertoire diverse in styles, genres, and forms. Included are folk and popular musics, but also music typically presented in concert hall settings. This includes forms that include the opera, uh, symphony, sonata, concerto, and various other types of compositions. Black Americans compose music utilizing these forms, yet imbuing their compositions with distinctive elements that linked this music to their heritage. Sometimes this was done through a title containing a reference to black cultural life. Sometimes the reference was musical through the incorporation of idioms like folk-like melodies, use of blue notes, or jazz rhythms. As early as the 1900s, there were black American composers writing in this tradition, including one Florence Price, who moved to Chicago in 1927, and whom Eileen Southern cites as the first black woman to achieve distinction as a composer. There was also the composer William Dawson, who studied music at the Chicago Musical College and performed with the Chicago Civil Civic Symphony Orchestra, and today, our music maker, Regina Biocchi, who studied music at DePaul and Roosevelt University, and whose compositions have been performed by the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. The History Makers Project, as described on its website, preserves African-American stories of success against the odds, achievement in the face of adversity, and stories of inspiration. I believe you will be inspired by what you hear this evening as we listen in on a conversation on making music and learn from our panelists' collective sounds of experience. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Sands. What a rich history. You gotta love that. Okay. Without further ado, the History Makers, in cooperation with the Illinois Humanities Council and the Chicago Department of Cultural Affairs and the Center for Black Music Research, are all collectively proud to present Sounds of Experience. The atmosphere for music in Chicago was the best. I think the best in the world. Because a lot of musicians came to Chicago from other parts of the country to get their skills together and to get a chance to tighten their game up. And then maybe later on they wound up in New York or something like that, New York. But Chicago had a lot of live music going on. You know, 63rd Street used to be called the Street of Dreams. They had clubs all in down 63rd Street, blues clubs, jazz clubs, everything. 63rd and Cottage Grove. They weren't paying a whole lot of money, but they were they were clubs where you, you had a chance to play the music, you know, and if you really played it, then you could get the people's ear and attention, you know. So you had to learn how to do that, you know, to play for people. We were in a bar hanging out, and this bar, and there's a barmaid in there. I'll never forget her, her name was Nettie Gray. 
uh, and she, we were talking about, well, we're getting ready to do this recording session and whatnot. And she said, well, there's this new song. You ought to record this. You ought to record this song. She said, oh, well, you know, she said, wait a minute, I'll play it for you. She put a quarter in the box or whatever and played this record, the in crowd for us by Doby Gray. And she said, ah, yeah, do, 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 we said, well, maybe we ought to try that anyway. So what the heck? <laughs> so the next day we put together a quick arrangement on it and, uh, and we recorded it at the session. And that was the, the hit record. We were the opening act at, at the Apollo Theater for R&B programs. They put us right smack dab in the middle of an R&B show as the opening act. And we were instrumentalists. We'd come out and play. We'd play for everybody, you know? We'd play jazz tunes. We would play an, R, an interpret an R&B song, you know? And uh, we sang. We, we, we entertained. We tried to reach out and touch people. And it was successful in that sense. But uh, the agents and managers didn't know what really to do with us. The big shot is when you when you play your music and you reach out and you touch somebody with your music. Really, you know, make them stop and start patting their foot, you know, or make them smile or make them laugh about something cute that you played or slick that you played or something emotional that you played. I married at a real young age. I was 18 years old. And I moved to Port Arthur, Texas. And I, I started going to night school there. And then I, I bought a guitar and started messing with the guitar. And then got, got some songs together and started playing and I quit school. I was playing in a lot of white clubs, you know, playing the rock and roll stuff, you know. And I, I hadn't got into the blues yet, but that's what I wanted to play. And then my first wife separated and I wanted to get away from uh, pulled out there, so I told him to book an in and said, book me as far as you can, you know. And that's how I, I met up with Sam Cook and L.C. Cook, and, and I came to Chicago. I wanted to be different from anybody else, because I know that's what it takes for anybody to, to really make it, you know, be good but different. And I think that's what did it, because I took up, I had, like, two and a half years, you know, just to put this stuff together. I mean, that was my music, that the acoustic style. John the hooker, boom, 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 boom. Yeah, oh man, that, you know, because we used to dance to that music a long time ago. Lightning Hogan, uh, and that was the only two. Uh, and three, Muddy Waters. That's all they had, you know, in the country, they'd go get that. And I used to dance to that years ago. And what made me feel good, I got a chance to play with all those guys that I used to listen to when I was a kid. So I enjoy entertaining, entertaining people and writing songs. And my father was a big jazz buff, so he had all the Charlie Parker, um, Dizzy Gillespie, uh, Louis Armstrong, uh, Duke Ellington. Uh, so there was always music in the house. Um, my mother sang in church choirs and she immediately involved us. I can remember singing a church choir from the time I was four years old. Uh, and I should say each of us learned to play an instrument. Uh, it was one of those ways that my mother kept us busy. I was in marching band, studied counterpoint with a man, Nathaniel Green. Uh, had two wonderful, actually three wonderful trumpet teachers. Dr. Naylor played trumpet. There was another guy, Lionel Bordelon, who really influenced me to go to Roosevelt University. And another man, Stanley Pollock, who was one of the original members of the group Chicago. The thing that I liked the most about Roosevelt was the theory program. It was very thorough, um, and just everything that I wanted in the program. The thing I disliked about it is that they had no respect for popular music, no respect for jazz. I put my music on the piano, uh, and my teacher picked it up whirled it on the floor and said, this is pop shit. We do not teach this at Roosevelt University. And so I went home and I mentioned it to my father. And he said, Reg, what you're gonna have to do is learn how to write music for yourself and how to write music for your grade. Most of the concerts that I've had, I produced them myself. And I, you know, just learned how to overcome my shyness and go and ask people for money. And now, I've been able to 
Uh, my goal is always to have at least one concert every year in October, and ideally two to four concerts a year. And so far, since 1990, the past decade or so, I've been able to do that. And so music to me is something that when I think about what is it that I want to do, that if I could not do it, I would not want to live. And that's what music is for me. A lot of my musical background comes from my mother's influence, with music, the influence she had on me. Some of the um, albums and uh, music that she played during the day, you know, I'm absorbing this as a little boy. You know, she had all the Ink Spots records. She had Nat King Cole. When I first moved to Gary, Indiana, my best friend, he and I just for fun, we were 15. So we would sit up in his house all day and, you know, whenever, listening to these songs. And he would point out each voice to me. Sing along with that voice, show me. This is the first tenor. This is the second tenor. What's the second tenor is doing? This is what the bass tenor is doing. That was my introduction to learning how to sing. In 1953, the original Spaniel, they launched the VJ label with Baby It's You. And then in 54, they made the Night Sweetheart Goodnight. Okay. Now, at this time, two of the main members of the group dropped out. My friend James Cochran, and we called him Bimp. They knew him. So Gerald, the bass singer, wanting to keep some semblance of a group together, went and got Bimp because he knew he was a singer. So he in turn came and got me, you know. And like I say, this was in 56. We're talking about the 50s, when they were still hanging black people in the South, when Emmett Till was found like he was found. And yet our songs don't have no hatred in them. Think about it. The theme of our songs does not have hatred. Why do people still like to come to these oldie shows? Because they walk out of there feeling uplifted. Because the songs are about love. The songs are about good relationships. Because we had those kinds. We were singing about what we, what we were experiencing in spite of that. You couldn't go to any place that didn't have our songs all over the jukebox. The McGuire sisters covered Good Night, Sweetheart, Good Night. And at that time, they did not play and would not play black music on white stations. So consequently, when the black music came out with the white artists doing it, the whole country is thinking this is, these are their songs. Now we want to start off, first of all, with each of you, just briefly tell me what was your first, earliest memory of music, Mr. Young? You know, for me, it was in my house. Uh, my family, everybody loved music. My father, well, uh, when he was young, he played guitar and mandolin. And then my oldest brother, he was always singing and playing his, you know, his guitar and everything, and I had to do that, too. Uh -huh. But his, his music and the radio, between my brother and the radio, and my mother humming songs to me in the church. There it's you music go. all the time. Mr. Porter? Uh, my earliest recollection would be the uh, collection of music that my parents had. And uh, these were 78 records, you know, the ones you could drop and they mm. would break. <laughs> right, <laughs> thick. Uh, <laughs> the Ink Spots, Nat King Cole, Dinah Washington, they, they like these artists. And so these are songs that I just grew up hearing as a young child. Were either of your parents musicians? No. They no? Weren't. So you were the first one out, Mr. Brooks? Well, I've been experienced by music through my grandfather. He played a banjo. And then after that, I would see, uh, used to listen at uh, Lightning, Hawkins, and uh, Muddy Waters on the ice cream truck. <laughs> oh, really? Were you riding the ice cream truck or they were just playing? No, we, we were running to catch up with it. <laughs> uh, we were living, say about, say, about a half a mile off the highway, which was a gravel road. Uh -huh. And we'd hear this music, say, maybe about five or six miles old away on one of these big loudspeakers and I heard this guitar by Lightning Hawkins and uh, I fell in love with the guitar and I didn't want to tell my grandfather. Because <laughs> you associated with ice cream, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> it was hot down there. Uh, this is what it was, <laughs> Louisiana is where he came from. And Ms. Bayaki? Well, uh, my earliest memories of music, uh, my father played bluegrass fiddle and harmonica. And so everyone, he has four brothers, and they each played an instrument. Uh, they're from Kentucky, so it was that type of music. 
Uh, my mom sang in choirs, and she listened to a radio station in Chicago that some people might remember, it's WSDM, the station with the girls and all that jazz. It was all female disc jockeys. Oh. So we listened to WSDM with my parents, and then we heard bluegrass, and then my grandmother played uh, for uh, Sanctified Church. She played organ. So I would sit on the floor and watch her feet move the pedals as she was playing, and, and I just kind of crawling around on the organ listening to her play gospel music. You, so you sounded like you had some influence on your video, with, and you were obviously had quite a variety that you listened to growing up. How did you end up choosing classical music? Well, uh, I wanted to be classically trained because I realized from listening to my parents and listening to my grandparents that I wanted to have the foundation, and I felt that the, the art music or the classical music, as people tend to call it, uh, would give me the foundation where I could, I learned how to read, uh, I can read any, I can read a jazz chart, a blues chart. So it was, uh, it was kind of a natural place to go uh, so that I felt like I could springboard from there into all of the other things that I grew up with. Okay. And Mr. Brooks, what, what drew you to the guitar? What was it, just the, the listening on the, to the ice cream truck or was there something specific about the sound that you liked? <laughs> it was the sound, I think, you know, I had a, a, a an uncle, you know, he is married to my mother's sister, and uh, he brought it. He wasn't that good with it, but it's just something about the guitar. I like the sound better than I did the banjo, and I didn't want my grandfather to know that. <laughs> so I used to sneak over and, and stay all night over there and, and get him, try to get him to teach me to play, play the guitar. So okay. that's how I fell in love with the guitar. Now, doo-wop music for you, Mr. Porter, that was the popular music of the era. Was that what really drew you into it? Well, you know, actually, uh, when I first started singing, uh, doo-wop not, had not been coined as a phrase yet. Where did, where did that, do you know where it came from? Yes. Uh, doo-wop is an actual phrase, number one. It's, an act, it's a literal phrase that is used in the background of many songs, many of the Spaniel songs, but Huh. There are groups that use that phrase in their background precede, that preceded the Spaniels. And uh, one is a, a, a spiritual group, and uh, the other are other contemporary groups of ours that use that. Uh, the Dales use that in their background. They have the, uh, many songs with this in there. The Flamingos, who are a Chicago group, and the El Dorados. So really, you were what, your group was one of the sort of originators of this term, even. Okay. and. Uh, at the time that the Spaniels came out, you can say that this is about the time that that, that co term became a colloquial term okay. to describe a certain facet of music. But so that's actually how it evolved. I see. So were you drawn particularly to that sound? Well, actually, um, I was drawn in through spiritual singing mm -hmm. because I had a friend who also is one of the Spaniels. Uh, prior to that, he was a gospel singer. And we met in Gary, Indiana. We both moved there from Chicago uh, at different times. But when we met, uh, he was a gospel singer. And the local group there recruited him, uh, which was Joiner's Five Trumpets in Gary, Indiana. And we became friends. And we used to sit up and listen to records. Mm -hmm. And like I say, he used to just teach me these parts. So I really fell in love with it through gospel groups. I mean, the Swan Silvertones, the Soul Stirs, the Pilgrim Travelers, the Blind Boys. These are the groups that I really loved first. Ah. And then from there, we branched off into listening to the Clovers and the uh, uh, Orioles and the Ravens and groups like that. OK, all right. Now, Mr. Young, you are a, a stand-up bass player. And this mm -hmm. is the, the, a traditional sort of jazz sound. Mm -hmm. how, did you get, how did you fall in love with this sound, this style? Well, actually, I started as a guitar player. Huh? And, uh, I played guitar for a while with uh, Eddie Harris when we were kids. Mm -hmm. But when I got to high school, they didn't have guitar in the concert orchestra or the big band or the, you know, the marching band. So my brother said, well, take up the bass. Maybe you'll get a job every once in a while to help pay for your guitar lessons. <laughs> 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 but it got so that uh, I couldn't get a job on guitar. At that time, there were so many great guitar players walking around Chicago, uh, but they needed some bass players. So, but I, I got involved in the sound after listening to a few of my heroes, you know. And, uh, like who? Who were your heroes? Well, uh, Slam Stewart uh, mm -hmm. was one of my heroes. And Ray Brown, he came around. And mm -hmm. Oscar Pettiford, mm -hmm. who actually, he played cello and bass. And uh, actually, I started playing cello, jazz cello, wow. after I heard him. And I played both cello, uh, jazz cello and bass. And uh, these, these heroes, I, I started hearing all these records. 
and especially the bass player that was with, Com not Com bass, with Duke Ellington's band. My brother took me to see them when I was about 10 years old. Oh, that know? must have been incredible. Well, experience. the exposure was fantastic. Uh, they were playing at the Chicago Theater, and Josephine Baker at the time was making a comeback in the country. Ah. The band was beautiful. They had all these nice suits on and shiny horns, and all of a sudden, music was just great, and Duke was so suave. And then he introduced Josephine Baker, and she came out. Oh. And I said, that's where I want to be. I bet you did. <laughs> I bet you did. And the bass player was just, he was just smiling. At me. <laughs> Sounds like a great story. <laughs> Mr. Brooks, how did your career begin? How did you, how you, how did you get going, get, that, get your first jobs and start right out in your professional career? Well, I, just, I guess it was like an accident. You know, I wanted to play guitar and I went and bought a, I bought a guitar and, and I had one of the little small record players I would learn note for note by there. This happened, I see in about three or four weeks, I was playing a little bit. And so it happened, this, uh, this guy played a chord, accordion, Clifton Chenier, came by, passed by my house, driving a big Cadillac. <laughs> I turned around, I, I said, that's one of these days I'm gonna get me one like that. <laughs> Wishing, you know? Uh-huh. And uh, then he, he turned around and come back, and you know, and I didn't hear the car, because what I do, I would turn my back to the, to the street, you know? I was staying on the second floor, and all of a sudden I felt something in my back, you know. I turned around, and there was this great big guy standing up there, and he scared me. <laughs> and he so he sought you out. He introduced himself, you know, and said, my name is Clifton Chenier, and I play card, and he said, oh, who are you playing with? And I said, I don't think I'm good enough to play with anybody. And he said, well, he said, you sound good to me, you know. And we talked a while, and then he invited me to his house, Mm -hmm. And I started playing Zydeco music. I, I think my first music I, I learned to play was uh, Zydeco music. I want to get a little bit more into okay. the emotion of the music in just a minute, but I want to ask what music means to you. Let's start with you, Mr. Young. <laughs> That's a hard question. It's, it's everything. Uh, most people don't understand uh, how important music is in their lives. You go to a movie, you got to have some music. You, you're making love, you got to have music. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Music is everywhere. When you when you're communicating with God, you a lot of times you communicate through the spirit with the music. The music brings you in there. You know, when I was a child, it was the music. My mother used to pat her foot in church, and I'd crawl around the floor and I try to hold her foot, and she was feeling the spirit. But that's where she got herself together with the, her music. My father it was a different type of music that he loved, but. But it's everything to me because mm -hmm. it's, my, it's what I want to do for, for my, the rest of my life. I've done it all my life mm -hmm. since I was a child. And, and I know how important it is to people. They use it as therapy. Most people, they get the blues, they feel bad about something, they go in here, band playing, them, playing some music, and now they whoop one on your head. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you start to smile, you come back into life, you know. Mm -hmm. I played, one time I played a, a spiritual, and I made uh, one person cry. There was a little, little old lady in the audience, we were playing in Detroit, in a club in Detroit, and she used to come by, and it's a little, little lady sitting in the audience, and, and I decided to play Motherless Child. Mm. And I played it on cello for her, and she cried, you mm. know? And uh, it wasn't that it made me feel like I, I, I had touched her. It didn't make me feel like I'd done something great, but I, that I had touched somebody with the music. Mm. It was That's the music, you know? It was a blessing. No, I think it was you that said that, about <laughs> music being that center to you. Well, tell yeah. me a little bit about what music well, was Well, I think LD sort of summed it up. You know, when you think about just the human experience, mind, body, and soul, I mean, the music is there. They're, I mean, on an intellectual level, they're even discovering, you know, how Mozart makes students more uh, mathematically inclined. And it's not just Mozart, it's, it's Miles and anyone else that, can, that has the power to touch someone. And I think, you know, I don't know that I can add anything to what he just said, mm -hmm. but I just know that when I wake up tomorrow, if I have music, I, I don't want to wake up. As a matter of fact, I wrote a song about that. Just let me sleep if I can't hear the music. Oh. You know what I mean? Seriously. That's a nice title. Yeah, I teach a, um, a music appreciation class to, on a university level. 
And something happens when I put that music on that, I mean, it just really changes the students. And we start from the beginning of time, music in Africa, you know, the cradle of all civilization, and we move through Western, West Africa, West Europe, the United States, all of the states. And just, I mean, there's, you'd be surprised, you know, how many students, they would beat me to class. I've never been in a situation where I walk into a classroom and the students are waiting. Mm -hmm. You know, and the, 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 the sad thing about it is that someone did not introduce them to that music in kindergarten that they didn't have it throughout grammar school, throughout high school. And I think uh, if, if we're dealing with a tragedy, that's it, that people actually think that we can live without the arts. Mm. But again, you know, as, as LD mentioned, they don't want to live without the music uh, in their lives, you know, whether you're talking about celebrating uh, something or, or when you bury someone, when someone is born, any celebration, there's always music, yet it's the first thing to be cut. And, and that's, that's a tragedy. That is a tragedy. I think all of us would probably agree with that. Mr. Porter? I had the opportunity in 2000 to give a presentation at the uh, University of California, Santa Barbara, on music. And the um, person who uh, brought me there picked the topic. I mean, they, they picked the topic, and the topic was why black music heals. Now, needless mm. to say, what I was preparing was not in that context at all. So when she gave me this topic, I had to completely reorient myself and just uh, uh, reconfigure everything that I had planned to uh, give. And so this made me uh, examine that statement. Music, good music, is a, has a healing effect. Now, frankly speaking, all of our music that we have now evolved out of Negro spirituals, or as they say, slave music, mm -hmm. because this was music that was inspired, meaning this is music of the spirit. It's not of the head, it's of the heart. Mm -hmm. And there is a difference in music that comes just from the head and music that comes from the heart. Most of black music, early black music, was untutored. It was untutored. The music that was uh, the most effective among us was untutored, meaning nobody taught anybody right. how to express that music. It was an expression of soul. And in searching for a beginning to this presentation, I went to the scriptures. And I went to the account of the first king of Israel, who was Saul. Saul had problems with depression. Now, as everybody knows, if you know the scriptures, David was a musician. <laughs> And of all things, David was chosen to come in and play before Saul when he had these attacks. Mm. And the scripture says he was healed. Early music therapy. Yeah. yeah. And so I'm, I'm saying that to say that good music has a healing effect because it's something that affects the spirit. It elevates the spirit. It embellishes the spirit. No question. And so without music, I mean, we, we could not really, the spirit could not survive without music. Mr. Brooks, you talk about that feeling. You couldn't get the feeling of the genre that you loved, which I think is interesting. Here was this music that you loved, and yet you had this desire to get deeper into it because you couldn't, you know, you couldn't get it until you were immersed in it. Talk a little bit more I had, about that. I had, to, I had to get, I had to come back. Not, well, I haven't been to Chicago yet. <laughs> Did you get here? But I had to get to Chicago. Did you know I, Chicago was going to be the center because you could have gone to the Mississippi Delta? No, thing. you know, it just, I, I met so many musicians from, from Chicago when I was living in Texas. Uh, and a lot of the guys moved from Chicago to Houston, Texas to, to get a chance to play with people like B.B. King and Gabe Mal Brown. Uh, I, I, I figured. For me to get a chance to be to play like them, you know, play the real blues is to come to Chicago. Mm -hmm. And so I made up my mind and I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> and it worked. Yeah, but you know, it's, it's a little more to that. You know, what feeling what are you talking speaking about, about the feelings. You know, I get so deep involved into what I'm doing until a lot of people, you know, think I'm crazy sometimes. <laughs> 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 you know, because I, I like a lot of times, I don't I don't really feel good until I I get on the bandstand and 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 playing what I, what I feel right then. Like a lot of times, I have a, uh, a to come up and play tunes that this person requested and this person requests. 
And I'm not into it, but I play it because I want to please everybody. Mm -hmm. But like most of the time when I'm, when I'm there and I've had a couple of drinks a little bit, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I go up there, I'm going for me. Mm. And, and if they know how good I feel when I get that away, they will make me pay the play. <laughs> <laughs> they have no idea, wow. Well, really, you know, I mean, it's just like uh, I'm sitting on a couch and you all are psychiatry or something for me. In your house, is that <laughs> right? Know, I, I, that's, how, that's, how, that's how I feel when I walk up the bandstand. I feel real good, I, you know, but the people be still talking about me walking out the door. That's you know, a good thing. Good. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good thing, that's a good uh, thing. But, uh, I, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a feeling like, you know, because I, I never did, I didn't learn to read anything until I had made a whole bunch of records. And reading why I did that, because I wanted to speak the language so I could tell guys like them, play this, play this, you know. But I would, what I would do, I took the shortcut. I would get a tape recorder and play all the parts. And I would, you know, not give them, give them their parts on, on, on the tape or something. Is it important, do you think, to know to read music from somebody who, who learned by ear? Is it, do you think it's important to understand? Yeah, well, it, it, it's a, it's a, you can learn quicker. Or oh, some people just have it, have it inside, you know, it's from here, from the heart. And some people just can just play what they hear. And ain't nothing wrong with that, because I know a lot of big stars out here that can't read a note. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I ain't calling no names. <laughs> <laughs> but I know some, you know. Uh -huh. But, you know, people, a lot of times, when you see a guy that made it real big, you, you think, oh, this cat, is, you know, he's been to college for music, you know. But no, a lot of them can't even read a note. It shows it's really from the it's, heart. It's coming, it's coming from here. And once you, when you come from here, it's, it's, it's hard for, you take a person that can read real good, just a very few, I guess I would say the genius, that can know, I mean, can read real good and, and, and have the same feeling that someone that can't read. A person that can't read gonna give you more feelings than a person that can read, because you read it exactly what they put down there. You know. well, let me talk. Let's let, let's bring in uh, Regina about that because this is your area. You're trained <laughs> as a composer. Don't to get write. us in a fight here. <laughs> no, no, no. But this is interesting because this is your work. You and and do you ever find times? This is a two-part question. But first of all, how do you feel about what he said about that? And then also, when you hand your baby over to a musician, is there that sense of you're not performing this? This is something that you're hoping that, that they're going to embrace the way you've written it. Do you feel a sense of? This is my baby, do it right? Well, you are performing. One thing I learned from Hale Smith is time saved at the desk is time lost in rehearsal. Mm. So I have to write exactly what I want to hear. And I have to not only express it in musical terms, but if I want a note to be bent here, I want to tell them exactly where to bend it, how to bend it. If I want a sforzando, I have to write that in. If I want a pianissimo, that doesn't mean that you can't change things in rehearsal. but. Basically, the, the, the pa printed page is just a blueprint. A lot of people don't realize, you know, some of the people whom we consider great masters, Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, they were all improvisers. They were all improvisers. The music was written down so that when you get into a performing situation, you can pass out parts. That saves time in rehearsal. But basically, I've been even in a symphony rehearsal where the conductor put the baton down and said, you know, you're fighting the music, you're supposed to be making love. So they eventually come back to the feelings. The music is there, you know, uh, just so that you have a, a point, a common point of departure. Okay. A common point of departure. But you're so. not, that when, when he says something like that, it's coming from the, it's, it, for, so in, in other words, from you, it's just, it's, it's a guidepost almost, in a sense. Not only is it a guidepost, but I, I am, and I, and I think he is too, gifted with the ear that I can hear the music in Miles, I can hear the music in Beethoven, I can hear his music. If someone's laying it down, you know, there's a song that Betty Carter did, it doesn't matter who's putting it down, as long as the soul is there, uh -huh. you know what I mean? She says, jazz ain't nothing but soul, nothing but potatoes and grits, everybody can understand that. <laughs> in other words, I'm feeding you. I'm fee and if you don't feed the audience, whether you're playing classical violin or blues guitar or whatever it is, then it's just not there. Mm -hmm. So, okay. What about you guys? How do you feel? You know, I was just that? thinking concerning mm -hmm. classical music. You know, I have a very 
I love classical music. And I had to trace back and say, where did I get this appreciation for classical music? Because it wasn't something that I heard in my household. Mm. And guess where I traced it to? Where? When I was very young, we used to, uh, on Saturdays, we could go and see cartoons, 15 and 20 cartoons. You know, cartoons have classical music as the background. Mm -hmm. And I was knowing and learning classical songs and wondered why when I heard a classical song, why do I like this song? I had learned it when I was a small boy watching cartoons that's, that's and didn't even realize it. I didn't think about that either. What do you think about the, the idea of, of writing the music and, or the music coming directly from the heart? I know it both ways comes from the heart. But well, it's, it's a combination going on here. Uh, with Regina, I know if, you, if you've got a large ensemble to perform a piece of music, you've got to all be on the same page if the group is large, you know? If you, you make it a smaller group, you need less, less music written, you, and you get, that's why I love jazz, it's playing small ensembles. I love to play with big bands where I have written out parts for the bass lines and whatnot. I've experienced that to, in order to make the band passionate. Even that, when we would read the music, I'd have to give that edge to the tempo, you know, to make it, make it swing, you know, so people could bounce to it. If I played it straight like that, it, and mm -hmm. nothing happened. Mm -hmm. But I had to interpret the line that it was written mm -hmm. so it sort of to fit with the band. And with classical music, that's, it's a matter of interpretation. Absolutely. Well, let me ask you a little bit, too. Uh, jazz, especially some more traditional jazz, a lot of it is, is, is improvisational. Yes, yeah. So explain how, how that works. When you're, when you're in the process, you're in a, in a, in a trio uh, or oh. a rhythm section, how do you feel your way? I mean, I, obviously, I mean, you have to know it. It's probably innate in your, but how do you get in there? How do you find your spot? And, well, take it up and first of all you, there's a language that's that's unwritten up between jazz musicians where they play they know how to interpret a piece of music maybe they've never played together before but they know how to turn back from one chorus to the next chorus and they know how to and uh, imply that hey i'm going this way with something and when you do that then i got to do this if so is somebody this, leading gonna, or are there yeah, various yes, leaders it's various leaders the uh, the 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 bass player is controlling the bottom of the music, the bass of the chord. The drummer is controlling the coloring of the music, you know? We're, actually, we're, we're interpreting what would happen with a big band or a big orchestra, but we're doing it with a small ensemble. Mm -hmm. So the bass is playing the bottom line of it. The, co the chords are constructed or, or elaborated on by the piano player. The drummer puts icing on this and helps the rhythm to be felt in the icing to the music, to mm -hmm. the sound. And whoever's playing the lead on the saxophone or a guitar, they play the melodic line. But I, what I'm doing with my bass is to help make his thing happen. Mm -hmm. If he plays a certain way, then I've got to do a certain thing. But improvisation itself is, for the soloist, it's the matter of how he feels now about that piece of music and what these other guys are doing, what the rhythm section is doing. If I'm making it real tight and hard, he's going he's to play like that, you know? Mm -hmm. He's going to get better. It's sort of like, sort of like goose in the guy, you know? You got a little sharp stick back there, you just, you know, come on, <laughs> get up a little bit on, you know? It's, it's like that, it's like that. It's not like, it's like, what it is, just, you don't play it, it's like that. See, a beat, a lot, well, Regina, you've been through this. A beat has a, so many different parts. You can play it where it stands up straight, or it leans forward, or it can lean back. With jazz, you want to make it lean forward. And if you've got a guy that's improvising a solo, and he wants that music to, to, to really drive, you've got to play with that edge. Mm -hmm. Ray Brown was an excellent actor mm -hmm. as a bass player. Mm -hmm. But the improvisation, the actual solo, is how that guy feels about that music at that time. You know, because maybe he came to the job and he's, uh, he's not feeling well, so he plays a certain way. Or maybe he gets to the job and he's all excited. He, you know, wife just had a baby. He's all excited about having this little baby boy. So he's playing, you know, he's all excited. See, the, uh, the emotions are involved in improvisation because the, music, uh, the musician has the experience, and after a while he has the experience and the technique to perform things that he hears in his head. Oscar Peterson was very good at that. Mm -hmm. If he thought it, he could play it. Mm, that's, you know? that's one of my I, And uh, it's, he's fantastic at that. He, he thinks it, he plays it. And he plays within the boundaries. It's like being in a zone. He plays within the boundaries of the music but yet still he plays what he feels. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Let me get to, to something. I, there's, I could ask you a million questions, but I do want to touch on 
uh, contemporary music today, black music today, we've got genres, you've talked about the evolution of all music, and, and I think most people would say that there is an evolution from black music, obviously today with hip hop and, uh, and rap. How do you guys feel about the, the contemporary urban music, and, and are, you are you happy with it? Do you think it's expressive? What do you guys think about it? Let me start with you, Mr. Brooks. Well, a lot of the time I listen to something that don't care what it is, I just turn it into the blues. <laughs> I'm, I'm listening and see if I can get a blues out of it. <laughs> Does it work a lot of time? Yeah. A lot of time I, I wrote a lot of songs on my way home, driving in my car, and listening to Changing Station, and listening to a country tune. And when I get home, I don't wrote me a blues tune. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Mr. Poe? Um, well, I think that as the music evolves, you know, I, I think of my own background. I think of what influenced me. And I think that the more the, the young generation, the more they look back and go, you, Think of how many hit songs that they went back and got and put out. Sampled, currently. yeah, there's a lot. They haven't one. heard it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm saying, to me, they did something that was really marvelous in that they didn't have the kind of foundation and background. They almost came up with something out of nothing. Mm. You know, I'm speaking of the rap style. They kind of, it, it sort of just sprang from nothing, so to speak, because they didn't have the foundation of having known all of the artists that we grew up with because they weren't played and because uh, of, of certain conditions. So this just, again, shows that there's a spirit in, uh, in black people that cannot be suppressed. I mean, and we improvise. That's, it's an improvisation, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a way out improvisation, mm -hmm. but it's an improvisation. And it's been very successful, and it certainly has caught the ear of the whole world. Mr. Mm -hmm. it's, it's every, every period of uh, time has its own music. You know, right now, the music is involving, like you see, in hip hop and rap and it's so many other things that in fusion, there's fusion and jazz. There's a lot of new things going on. Uh, and they're not totally new, but they're expressed in a new way. Mm -hmm. uh, rap is not new. Uh, rap was done a long time ago to bongo players. Used to sit around and join the beat generation, they'd play the bongos. And the guy would sit there and recite poetry. But now they deal with it in an iambic pentameter mostly. But it's basically what was done before. But it's extended. Now it's done with, a, with more, um, with a fervor, a different fervor, mm -hmm. and a different fire to it. And the things that they're doing with the words, the lyrics, they're, they're making statements a lot of times. And it's a statement of the times. And sometimes you don't agree with it, and, but that's what's happening. Mm -hmm. You know, there are people out there that are, that are, are mad, that are, excuse my expression, they're pissed off about something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they are. And, and yeah, the rappers that get a chance to say some of these things. Some of the things I don't agree with because they're, uh, some of the obscenity, for obscenity's sake, is, is a waste of time to me. And it's crude, it's lewd, and I have no use for it. But some of the guys have start, start doing some thinking about what's happening in the world today. And they're making statements. There's even spiritual groups that, that use rap to express mm -hmm. themselves in spiritual, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in a spiritual form. Mm -hmm. But this is with rap, and, and the same thing with, uh, with, with all of the other music. It's, it's expression of the times. Mm -hmm. and, uh, if, you play, if you're a bebop, old bebop musician like myself, you have to have your ears open and your mind open mm -hmm. to everything because all of the music, Regina's form of classics, that was a big influence on it. The blues, if you can't play the blues, you can't play jazz. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you don't know something about the blues, you can't play jazz. And the feeling, the expressions that, that were done during the doo-wop period were so romantic. Mm -hmm. They were so romantic. Mm -hmm. you know? And this is the passion. These, all these things are involved. Mm -hmm. And nowadays, it's, they're just saying some of the same old things, but saying it in a new way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they're making statements of the time, too. And of course, years ago, they had people like uh, Billie Holiday. Mm -hmm. She wrote a thing called Strange Fruit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, familiar with it. Yeah. It was a statement of the times about lynchings. Mm -hmm. And then later on, Fabus, who was a governor that was a bad person, uh, Charlie Mingus wrote a tone called The Fables of Phobos, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah. things of um, political statements and whatnot. And the music is, is doing that. These kids are staying, make, making statements, but you have to weed, it's just like always music, you have to weed out, uh, you know, <laughs> stuff that, you have to find it, it's find there. It. But some of the things that are happening get in the way, and uh, 
I think I, I blame the record companies and radio stations for a lot oh, that's, of that. That's a whole you know, because discussion. it's a waste of time and, and, and energy. But there is some good music and there's a good spirit in there. Mm -hmm. Some of these kids are really work hard on these lyrics and things. And it takes do, some talent yeah. to do that. They do, yeah, yeah, they, they really are. What do you think, Ms. Bianca? Well, there, I have a couple of thoughts. First of all, I, I'm not offended when people call me a classical composer, but I'm a holistic composer. I write blues, I write jazz, I write, I've written a rap. Uh, and secondly, uh, and, and this sounds like shameless promotion, and it is. <laughs> <laughs> why not? And, right, why not? <laughs> but um, I've, I was involved with the uh, project with Oxford University Press, Black Women in America. And it started out as a two-volume encyclopedia uh, published by Carlson Publication. Then it was developed into 12 volumes. And now Oxford University Press has taken it. And basically, there, are, there will be volumes, like I wrote articles on hip hop, I wrote articles on jazz art, and it's all about women. But I, I you know, was very anxious, and not anxious, eager to write about hip hop simply because I had no respect for hip hop music. Hmm. And I felt it was my responsibility as a musician to learn hip hop if I was going to say that I disliked it. And you know, my husband Greg would come in and like, what are you listening to? <laughs> Because he loves hip hop, you know, he likes it. But it was like, what are you doing listening to it? Uh -huh. And then once he realized what I was doing, but when you listen to the music and you realize there are two things happening. First of all, hip hop is probably more than anything else responsible for the resurgence of poetry. Poetry is one of those things in school that's a real tough sell. It's hard to sell to kids because they think of poetry as being something stiff and you know, the only thing about uh, hip hop poetry is that most of it rhymes, a lot of it doesn't, but still you've gotten a lot of people who normally would not have been writing, who are writing poetry. Let's talk about, quickly, 10, 15 seconds if you can, about, it, do you think history minimalizes, tries to minimalize black music? Let's start with you, uh, Yes, it does, but that goes back to my, one of my, my pet points, and that is, it is the parents' primary responsibility to educate their children. The school actually uh, subsidizes, so to speak, what you do at home. So the answer is yes, but with our permission, uh -huh. because we don't do anything to, 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 counter. to counter it. Mr. Brooks? I think uh, all music still alive. It just takes somebody to come along and make it different, make a taste for, for other people in this time. Mm -hmm. Good point. Mm -hmm. Mr. Young? Well, Minimalizing the, the black effort is, it's true it's been done, but it's, it, but it's impossible to really cover it all up because uh, Afro-American music has influenced the world. There would be no Beatles, there would be no Elvis Presley, there would Correct. be no pop singers the way we have Absolutely. today if there weren't some people that were involved in this music. We, uh, we've, we have a legacy that we left. They, they, at one time they were saying that uh, Jazz was the only cultural contribution we've made to the world. It's not the only cultural. Blues is a cultural contribution. And we have so many people that are, that are like Regina that have a, a scope of all of this and, the, and are capable of playing and performing all of this type of music and, ex, and expressing it. And it's not going to be stopped by, nobody can really totally suppress it. They know, because you know, even when the Rolling Stones come to town, Mick Jagger come up, and the next thing you know, he's down on, on one of them places trying to find out where Muddy Waters played or, or where this man is playing so he can hear his music and deal with it and help his stuff to grow, because that's where he got it. Mm -hmm. Correct. And he'll admit it. They'll admit it. You know, a lot of those guys from England admit it. So it's hard to totally suppress it. And you should ask Don to repeat a comment that he made backstage about concrete and flowers. Oh, yes. <laughs> you concrete and flowers, yeah. Don. Concrete and yeah. flowers. Okay, uh, just imagine <laughs> a, an undeveloped area where there have been weeds and flowers or whatever growing, and then a construction company comes in and they lay cement. After a certain length of time, you will see plants come up through that cement. <laughs> because the natural, anything that's artificial cannot suppress the natural. Mm. It's impossible. There you go. Sounds of experience, your panelists, one more round of applause.